Good evening, everyone. My name is Arlene Shainer, and I am the Historical Collections Librarian at the New York Academy of Medicine. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our event this evening. Here at the New York Academy of Medicine, we are champions for health equity, and we tackle the barriers that prevent everyone from living a healthy life. We're generating knowledge, changing systems, and engaging the public to ensure health for all. We do that work in lots of ways, but could we have the next slide, please? One of the ways that we do it is by providing support to people through our History of Medicine Library, which has been open to the public since 1878 and is one of the most significant history of medicine and public health collections in the country. While we can't welcome readers to the reading room right now, we do have other ways you can connect with us through digital collections, events, newsletters, and virtual visits. So you can learn more by going to our website or following us at NIAM History. And now I am delighted, so we can um, get rid of the slides now, Joey, thank you so much. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Rana Hogarth as our speaker this evening. Dr. Hogarth is an associate professor of history at the University of Illinois Ur Urbana-Champaign. Her research focuses on the medical and scientific constructs of race during the era of slavery and beyond. She's written about the ways in which white physicians medicalized blackness by defining it as a medically significant marker of difference. And she's currently at work on a project centered on the language used to describe the mixed race offspring of black and white people in both American medical and lay discourse and the ways in which those terms were appropriated and refashioned by by eugenicists. She will be speaking for us tonight on health inequities and the making of race, a short history. Please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you so much for this very um, generous introduction. Um, and I want to just um, thank everyone um, for their attention, for joining today. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share um, some slides with you. So I'm going to pull this up right now. And what I'm going to do is give you truly a short history. Um, perhaps that is tongue in cheek as I am going to cover probably about 300 years perhaps, but I'll do my best and try and get this down um, to a short 25 minutes. So what I wanna do though, is I'm going to begin with a quotation. Um, so as you see before you, this is a quotation from Dr. Benjamin Rush, who's a very well-known American physician um, he was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He's a patriot. He is um, highly regarded, let's say. Um, he's also very well known for being an abolitionist. So here is what Benjamin Rush wrote in some of his notes in the late 18th century. Quote, a fact from Dr. Mosley of the indifference in which Negroes submit to operations and surgery in the West Indies. Even in this country, the Negroes have been observed to handle fire without an emotion and not suffering from it like white people. So when I do say that I'm looking at his notes, these are his, um, his lecture notes. Um, and this is sort of that reference that we see to this Dr. Mosley. Now I bring this to your attention. Here's actually Dr. Mosley's treatise. I bring this to your attention and I start off this way because I want us to think about the circulation of specific ideas and particularly specific ideas about racial difference. Here is a quotation from a very highly regarded physician commenting on what he believes to be differences in suffering, differences in pain tolerance from the late 18th century. And I think it's important to note that this is coming from somebody like Benjamin Rush, because part of the um, main interventions in my book, Medicalizing Blackness, is to think about the process through which we talked about, came up with notions of innate bodily difference um, through their practice as physicians, but also to underscore the fact that much of these ideas about innate racial difference, and I would actually argue um, damaging ideas about black people's bodies did not necessarily emerge um, out of a desire to protect slavery, hence me beginning with Rush. So in a nutshell, I use the term medicalizing blackness to describe how white physicians and slave holding societies of the Atlantic world find blackness as a surrogate marker of difference with clinical value. So in other words, I'm just saying that this is a way in which race seemed real, right? How physicians were a part of making race seem real. As I said before, you didn't really need to have to protect slavery or be pro-slavery to, to have these kinds of beliefs. And I would actually argue that the concept of racial difference that still endures today in some medical discourses 
I would actually, and, and beyond, depends on this idea of medicalizing blackness, of seeing there being some kind of innate racial difference that holds both social and clinical value. So I wanna give us um, some examples of what I mean when I say medicalizing blackness and what that means in terms of the um, negative and damaging perceptions about black people's bodies that have circulated um, over several centuries. So I'm gonna start with um, the Philadelphia yellow fever epidemic of 1793 um, and the myth of innate black immunity to yellow fever. So I'll just give you a very quick rundown of, of what happens in Philadelphia. It's safe to say that it is indeed um, a public health crisis. Um, there is a yellow fever epidemic. Um, Philadelphia is a very important, busy city at the time. It's a temporary capital. Um, and what you see here is um, panic. People who have means flee the city. Um, many are suffering. There's high mortality. It is, it is pandemonium. Benjamin Rush, being a very well-known and respected physician, particularly in the Philadelphia um, community and intellectual circles, sort of is, is kind of emerges as a leader during this public health crisis. And he's pictured here. The other gentleman pictured is Richard Allen, who's a well-known free African-American minister in Philadelphia and a leader, one of the leaders, many leaders in the free African society of Philadelphia. Rush being an abolitionist, being very anti-slavery, saw himself as a friend and an ally of the, um, the free African society, very much had the same goals as them, sort of to see the end of slavery. During this yellow fever epidemic, um, it turns out that Rush and Richard Allen corresponded. And there's a good reason for this um, beyond sort of the anti-slavery um, correspondence. And the issue here is that Benjamin Rush, being this very learned, very um, adept physician, read up on yellow fever, read treatises, uh, older documents about yellow fever from other esteemed and established physicians, as was the custom. And he stumbled across um, a, a treatise by Dr. John Lining, a physician who um, practiced in Charleston, South Carolina, which means he would have seen um, a large number of patients and people of African descent. He actually worked as a court physician, so he had very close contact with um, captive Africans that would have been arriving in Charleston. Charleston was no stranger to yellow fever. It, it occurred there more times than I can count in the 18th century. The idea being is that Lining published in this treatise a uh, sort of observation on who gets yellow fever and who does not. And he famously said in this treatise, there is, quote, something about the constitution of the Negroes that renders them not liable to this fever, end quote. So this is what Lining had to say. Rush read Lining's work and saw this as a possibility of sort of uh, assisting the city of Philadelphia during this time of need in that he called upon the Free African Society to stay behind and help. Like, don't flee, stay behind and, and help out your fellow Philadelphian during this horrible um, epidemic because he believed, based on what Lining had said, that people of African descent were not going to get yellow fever. And here indeed is the letter that he writes to Richard Allen. Uh, this is a letter dated um, the 2nd of September, 1793. And I'll just read you the excerpt, quote, it has pleased God to visit the city with a malignant and contagious fever, which infects white people of all ranks, but passes by persons of your color. So here it should be quite clear that Rush is making a reference to um, black people being innately immune, that you are not going to get this fever. And what happens, of course, is that the free members of the Free African Society do indeed stay behind. Rush trains um, some personally as nurses and trains them in terms of how to bleed, how to tend to the, to the sick. Um, African Americans stay behind, um, they bury the dead, they clean, they, they basically do the dirty work in the midst of a terrible, terrible epidemic. The problem, of course, is that black people are not innately immune to yellow fever. They may have acquired immunity. But that's not quite something that was totally understood. There was a sense of, of, of immunity. If you get a disease, you, you may not get it again if you survive. But the issue was is that the assumption that Lining made was simply that by nature of their race, people of African descent were immune. We can now maybe look back in time and say, well, if yellow fever is endemic to parts of Western Africa, and if any of these captive Africans had survived about when they were younger, when the disease is maybe slightly milder, then yes, they would be immune but it would have been acquired, not racial. This is obviously not known at the time. So what happens is, is Benjamin Rush stating quite clearly, um, and this is in an account he publishes after the epidemic, that quote, I was led to believe that the Negroes in our city would escape it. In consequence of this belief, I published the extract from Dr. Lining's history of yellow fever as it had four times appeared in Charleston, South Carolina. Well, when I say that African-Americans do not get, uh, or are not innately immune, um, 
What I mean to say also is that Richard Allen actually contracts yellow fever. So the very person that Rush writes to does indeed contract yellow fever. He does survive. But what you see then is um, what I find considered to be a rare find in the historical record. And that is to say um, African-Americans responding to these ideas about supposed racial differences, innate differences. So what you see in front of you is an excerpt taken from a pamphlet that is actually published by Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, another minister. And I'll just read briefly where it says, and this is um, from Absalom Jones and Richard Allen speaking, quote, it, it is even to this day a generally received opinion in this city that our color was not so liable to the sickness as the whites. We hope our friends will pardon us for setting this matter in its true state. The public were informed that in the West Indies and in other places where this terrible malady has been, it was observed the blacks were not affected with it. Happy would it have been for you and much more so for us if this observation had been verified by our experience. So here's in fact the um, frontispiece of their, their pamphlet, the treatise that they write on, on sort of, or rather I should say the narrative about their perspective, what happens in Philadelphia. I bring this to your attention because this is an example of a assumption about innate um, racial differences that proves to be, well, tragically and dangerously incorrect and very damaging. But here's also a way in which to consider how African-Americans pushed back on some of these narratives and saying that we, we did suffer. So to say that we're immune to yellow fever is to kind of erase our suffering and our experiences during this terrible epidemic. Okay, so um, I will say that Benjamin Rush did backtrack and, and publicly did so. So in his account of um, the bilious remitting yellow fever, Rush actually disavows the idea of innate black immunity, but he still noted differences in suffering based on race. So he did say that, quote, the disease was lighter in them than in white people. He continued, I met with no case of hemorrhage in a black patient. Again, I'm not, I'm not an expert on yellow fever, but I do know it's a hemorrhagic fever and hemorrhage is pretty serious stuff. So he's basically saying the worst ravages of this disease I'm not seeing it in black people. They are not suffering in the same degree as whites. Okay, so I wanna move us along. That was in the late 18th century. I hope you don't mind if I thrust this into the 19th century a little bit. And I wanna to talk to you about a racial pathology and the idea of marking differences through racial pathologies. So we talked about innate differences, this concept of innate um, differences through immunity. But I wanna bring your attention to the creation of a slave disease, a racial pathology, known as cachexia africana. And this was used in reference to talk about dirt eating. Now, I do want to be clear. I understand that dirt eating does exist without necessarily a racial overtone, right? I understand that there is pica, and I understand that the practice is actually still, um, it still carries on today in some parts of the South where people eat a kind of clay. So that's really what dirt eating is. But cachexia africana, which is literally quite African wasting, was a reference to dirt eating amongst enslaved populations. The disease was actually poorly understood in the sense that there was no consensus as to really what caused it. Some speculated that it was a kind of pathological nostalgia from slaves who were ripped away from their homes. Um, but when the slave trade ends, the disease persists. There's a sense of a kind of um, seriously pernicious um, depression or mental disquietude. Others um, rightly cite malnutrition, which there was certainly malnutrition in most plantation societies. There's also a sense of deliberate wasting away. Um, and it is no um, secret that in the West Indies in particular, you did have very high rates of slave suicide. Cachexia africana is a wasting disease, which means that it left its victims unable to work. Now, if you think of a plantation society, it's especially if you think of plantation societies in the West Indies, where you have upwards of 200, 300 slaves on a plantation, a disease that causes slaves to not work is not going to stand. I'll just say briefly the symptoms um, are stomach pains, depression, um, dropsy, or edema, swelling, um, palpitations of the heart and shortness of breath. This is essentially a disease that if you see this on a plantation, it can spell ruin for a slave owner. And this is precisely how it was conceived of by members of the medical profession. I should add that physicians in the West Indies most certainly did make a good living um, by treating slaves on these massive plantations. And this was a problem. You would find them make references to stubborn diseases that they just could not treat. So for example, Thomas Dancer, who was a very well-known, um, highly trained physician, and highly trained, of course, by these standards, um, published in his Jamaica Practice of Physic in 1801, uh, the following statement on dirt eating. Quote, the man who could effectively explore the cause and cure of this disease 
so fatal to Negroes and so ruinous to their owners would deserve a statue. So he makes it quite clear that if one can gain mastery over this disease that has the potential to um, basically eat away at profits because slaves would not be able to work, um, there is a sense that sure, as a physician, they must treat their patients, but we cannot um, uh, sort of disaggregate the economic incentives and the desire for profit and the kind of commodification of, of African labor and African bodies that is going on during this time period. Now, I will say that this was a completely a construction of, of white physicians, Cachexia africana. Cachexia africana does not exist um, at this time anymore. Um, I will say that in creating this disease, right, or in, in referring to it as a thing, um, physicians all agreed though that it was refractory to treatment, that slaves most often did this in secret because when they were pressed on it, have you been secretly or have you been consuming earth, most slaves would deny this. Um, again, there was no general sense of whether this was truly something that was about malnutrition or resistance. And there were some cases where physicians would blame enslaved healers who they thought were meddling with the health of um, enslaved laborers and thought that they were interfering with their work as practitioners. So what we have with Cachexia africana is the creation of a racial pathology that I would actually argue um, frustrated white medical um, professionals on plantations, but it still existed as a way to say, we are authorities on these matters of black health and, and what is a considered to be a pathological behavior. And I will say at least just briefly for the United States, um, there are cases of physicians showing interest in Cachexia africana. And um, here is before you is just the image of the title page of a young medical student's um, medical dissertation. So this is from Joel B. Gresham from the Medical College um, of South Carolina. Um, and his, this is his MD thesis, which he wrote on the topic of Cachexia africana. And you can imagine that for someone like Joel B. Gresham, his intention was to stay in the South and treat uh, populations locally, which means that he may very well come up against a case of Cachexia africana in his medical career. So now I want to stay in South Carolina, but move on to the next point um, about sort of how medicalizing Blackness um, takes, uh, takes shape. And I want to look at medical institutions and medical training. And there's a, quite a lengthy quote, but I think it's actually quite significant to have this quote um, because it, I think, encapsulates the relationship between the emergence of medical institutions in the South and African-American communities in the South. So this is taken from um, Dr. Thomas G. Prelu, who was the first Dean of the Medical College of South Carolina. I will just say that the Medical College of South Carolina uh, is, is known as the oldest continuously operating medical school in the Deep South. That's sort of the language that is used to describe it. Uh, opens its doors, I believe in 1824. And from the Dean, who is very pleased with the fact that there is finally going to be this medical college and recognizing that in the 19th century, how hard it is for medical students to have access to bodies to dissect, to train on, he writes, or he notes in the meeting minutes, quote, no place in the United States offers as great opportunities for the acquisition of anatomical knowledge, subjects being obtained from among the colored population in sufficient number for every purpose and proper dissection carried on without offending any individual in the community. These impediments, which exist in so many other places, the prosecution of this study are not here thrown in the path of the student. In addition, the Southern student can nowhere else receive correct instruction on the diseases of his own climate or the peculiar morbid affections of the colored population." End quote. So to be very clear here, that Prelu is essentially saying, our medical college is going to succeed. It's going to be competitive with other older medical colleges because we have access to bodies. We can allow our medical students to get that training where they may have to go otherwise to the North or those with means to train in Europe, but they will not have to do that if they come to the Medical College of South Carolina. And he makes it very clear, very brazenly that even though people do not care for dissection, and I, I cannot emphasize enough that the 19th century really no one wanted to have their body dissected, he basically says, well, we don't have this problem because we're just going to rely on the bodies of enslaved people and people of color. It's very brazen, it's not hidden, it's not a secret. In fact, um, something similar appears in a newspaper. So this kind of gives you a sense of this attitude about um, you know, training and relying on these bodies that are easy access, but we again cannot uh, disaggregate this from the slave system that is going on very much at the same time. I wanna give you another example um, of this reliance 
on um, the enslaved people's um, bodies. So there's two images here. One, the smaller image, is taken from the Charleston Courier from um, 1826. And this is an advertisement from Dr. John Wagner, who actually served on the faculty of the medical college. Um, and he writes, the subscriber will receive at his office, number 61 Broad Street, slaves and colored persons laboring under surgical diseases and accidents. The diseases of the eye will need particular attention with a view of connecting them to this establishment. Now, the thing is, it seems like um, uh, just an advertisement for a slave hospital. And I can say that there are many of those in Charleston newspapers. The image on the left that says intelligence is actually taken um, from a New York medical journal. And it is an advertisement for Charleston anatomical rooms. And it is also put out by Dr. John Wagner. And he says um, that this is for the medical student, right? That they will go and get extra training in these anatomical rooms. And I would argue for a medical minded audience, anatomical rooms might conjure images of, of Paris and other cities where you have anatomical rooms to get extra training. Now, if you read the fine print, which is something my parents always told me, you will see a sort of a, a little disclaimer. And that says, in connection with the above plan and in order to afford every facility to the surgical student, Dr. Wagner has established a private hospital at his office in Broad Street, where he will accommodate slaves and colored persons affected with such diseases as only require surgical treatment. The diseases of an eye will in an especial manner receive particular attention with the hope of extending his plan at some future date into an infirmary, such as is now established in New York and other cities for the cure of diseases of that important organ. Surgical patients from the country will be received in like manner as from the city. Now, I should say, Wagner actually did spend some time in New York. He married um, a woman from New York before settling down in Charleston. And he would be referencing and the New York Eye Infirmary, which opened in 1820. So he's basically saying, I have grand plans to open my own kind of infirmary. But he's also saying, my anatomical rooms are directly connected to my slave infirmary, which kind of gives you a sense of, well, clearly there's going to be some hands-on experience for these surgical students. Likely this hands-on experience is going to come from tending to these enslaved um, or people of color who are showing up if they choose to show up at his, um, uh, his infirmary that he chooses to open. And again, it's the same address in Broad Street in Charleston. So what are we to make of all of this today? Well, um, I will say this. Um, yes, much has changed, thankfully, but we can think about the um, continuation and endurance of some ideas. So if we think back to the 2016 Hoffman et al. study on racial bias and pain assessment, um, we see that the investigators found some very troubling things in the results. Um, that based on a survey, they found that white lay people and medical students had false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites. The study also revealed racial bias and pain perception was associated with racial bias and treatment recommendations. And it showed that false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites continue to shape the way that we perceive and treat black people. Some of the beliefs that she highlights is that the belief that black people have thicker skin than do whites or that black people's blood coagulates more quickly than white people. Now, again, it, it was one of those things where that study came out and, and I did actually have somebody say, oh my gosh, can you believe it? And I'm like, well, I'm a historian of, of race and medicine. Yes, because I, I've seen this before, um, so I can believe it. Um, and we should think about this in terms of the relevance today when people talk about distrust in the medical profession and distrust amongst um, communities of color. Um, because this is a conversation about where this distrust comes from that maybe we need to have, especially in this time of COVID, where according to Pew Research Center, um, this is a study that was conducted, I believe, in November, 20, November 18th, 29th, and 2020, um, that shows a hesitancy um, towards the COVID-19 vaccine amongst Black populations in relation to other minority groups. Um, we can also think about um, a slew of articles that have actually come out in New England Journal of Medicine talking about the use of race correction in clinical algorithms. So if we think about this, um, you know, on one hand, people say, oh, race is a social construction. Oh, there's no biological basis. Or, oh, I don't see, I don't believe in this. But then, you know, how do you really explain the notion that, well, I guess technically, we are still using race correction, or at least some clinicians may be relying on these kinds of race corrections in, in their day-to-day -day practice. Um, as I said, a number of articles have recently come out saying that, well, what does this mean? What are the implications of this? Are you saying that there is an innate difference between black and white people? And, and what do we do when you have somebody who might be biracial? So if they are self-identifying themselves as black in one circumstance, they might perhaps have a higher GFR score, 
than if they identified themselves as white in another circumstance. Perhaps their score would be lower, which is not necessarily um, a good thing to have this kind of disparity based on this construct of, of, of race, of how this person is identifying. So I wanted to bring these things to your attention to sort of say, one, you know, there's a, there's a long history of this, and we can think about ways in which we could start a conversation about what knowing this history can do for us moving forward, um, and also kind of recognizing the slipperiness of race. So much of what I've said today does indeed come from my first book, um, and I'm really very much looking forward to our conversation, um, and I'm very much looking forward to the kinds of questions that we have. So on that note, I would just like to thank you all for your time. Thank you so much for a very thought provoking talk. Um, and before I welcome our discussant to begin the conversation with you, I just have to step back for a moment. I have to say, because I hadn't anticipated giving the introduction at the beginning, there are two things I forgot to say. The first is that this event is sponsored by, by the New York Academy of Medicine Center, Center for the Section on the history of medicine and public health. And we have the president of that section, Dr. Bob Rubin, to thank for his generosity tonight. The second thing is please put your questions in the Q&A while Dr. Racine and Dr. Hogarth are speaking together. And in about 15 minutes then, they'll, Dr. Hogarth will be taking questions from the audience. So I would now like to welcome our discussant, Dr. Andrew Racine, to join this conversation. Dr. Racine is Professor of Clinical Pediatrics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and the Chief of the Division of General Pediatrics at Einstein and the Children's Hospital at Montefiore. His research focuses on health issues confronting infants, children, adolescents, and their families in urban environments. So I will now turn everything back over to the two of you for your discussion. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Shainer. I just wanted to correct the record for a second. I at one time was actually the chief of the Division of General Pediatrics, but I am currently not in that position. Now I'm now the um, chief medical officer for the Monitor Health System. So just so that I don't make claims for being somebody that I'm not, at least not anymore. Let me um, begin by thanking Dr. Hogarth for a really uh, exceptional presentation and getting a lot of information into a relatively short time frame, which is not a, an easy thing to do. And I thought we could begin maybe by, I would, I would like to sort of talk a little bit about this important distinction that you make early on in your book about what we might consider to be some of the motivations of the physicians that you mentioned um, in the late 18th century with respect to the findings that they um, are promulgating in the literature. And in particular, the fact that they are actually not doing this in the service of uh, being apologists for chattel slavery, that there was a, an, another underlying, if you will, motivation for their work. And I thought that that was a particularly interesting observation because at first glance you think, okay, you know, these are folks who were working in a slave society. This would be the reason why they were trying to do this work, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So perhaps you could spend a little bit more time um, sort of expounding on why you think that's an important distinction to make. Sure, so thank you so much for your question. And yeah, I'd be happy to sort of explain a bit more. Um, so I'll start kind of maybe at the beginning. Um, I should say for those who are not super familiar with this kind of history of, of like race and medicine, there had been an impulse to just assume that some of these ideas could easily be dismissed by the ideas of just slave owners, that we should not pay them any mind, that it's the bad old days and they're on the wrong side of history, the end. And so as a young graduate student, um, I found great dissatisfaction with this because I thought to myself, okay, surely not every single physician who practiced in, in America was, was pro-slavery. There had to be some who didn't care or who were opposed. Um, there was also the, the interest in me in sort of understanding the difference it's sort of the idea of how people read difference, whether it be just sort of superficially. Um, and it became very clear to me in looking at some of these sources, particularly with Benjamin Rush, that one could understand an idea of difference, not just simply through skin color, but through observing differences in disease, which is why it's kind of quite interesting to use physicians as sort of my historical actors. And what I saw was this assumption of difference. 
right? The idea of saying, okay, well, people may be phenotypically like, you know, superficially look different, but really it should be about the measuring of their suffering, that they're, how their bodies respond. And that's when I started to pause and say, this might be a little bit more insidious, actually, that if we have somebody like Benjamin Rush, who, again, his life's work is, is real. He actually writes a letter to Thomas Jefferson convincing him that slavery is bad. So he was very much committed to this. So if you have somebody like Benjamin Rush, who, you know, some people will crudely call him like one of the good guys, but he is trafficking in this very dangerous kind of assumption that black people don't feel pain, they're insensible to pain. Well, that made me reflect a little bit more on the medical profession itself and sort of where some of these ideas came from. So for example, John Lining, who I mentioned, yes, he was in the South. Certainly he, um, he was a slave owner by marriage. He did not come up with this idea of innate black immunity out of some kind of malicious reasoning. He thought that he was simply recording what he saw during these epidemics in Charleston. And he did indeed, have, he was a credible witness to this because he did see so many um, African-Americans. So he could make this comparison. So for me then I'm realizing that this is a matter of um, a kind of regard of difference that becomes um, sort of repeated and propagated throughout medical texts and it becomes sort of authoritative. And it then becomes seen as, as proof that people can say, well, if the physicians see it and it's observable, then it must be real. And to me, that's, that's far more um, insidious, I think, than just saying a bunch of slave owners wanted to justify slavery, so we'll just make these statements. Um, so that's sort of where I started to see this, this, this obsession with difference or this ability to see difference rather than, than sameness in my sources. So that's, let's explore that a little bit more because I think this is really interesting. What occurred to me in reading the recounting of the, um, of the observations in the epidemics of yellow fever is that you have these physicians who, as you point out, uh, may be actually um, making um, important epidemiologic observations, that there are different prevalences in these different aspects of the community or the populations within these cities. And that, as you point out, they might not know why that was the case in the sense that we didn't really have a germ theory of disease. They didn't really understand the issue of partial immunity. They didn't really recognize that this might have been an endemic disease from the um, geographic areas where folks had originated. So therefore, they had um, some, some immunity. So, so the observation is a correct observation in an empirical sense. But as you point out, they ascribe a meaning to it that's that's a that's a misjudgment in a sense right which gets to the 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 question of whether or not essentially this is just another manifestation of uh, an underlying construct in the culture that is you will see it in music you will see it in literature you will see it in art and you will see it in medicine but it's all the same thing it's just that in medicine it's expressed this way as opposed to in popular culture in some other medium it's expressed that way and what we're seeing here among physicians essentially is what medical practice looks like in an inherently racist society this is this is just what it looks like right um what i think is of interest with regard to that interpretation of it is though, how do we explain the persistence of it, the enduring nature of it, the fact that it doesn't go away, even as our medical knowledge becomes more sophisticated and we get better at understanding where diseases come from. And I was wondering if you might want to talk. Yeah, uh, again, this is an, this is an excellent question. Um, and my goodness, I think, um, you know, if I could explain the enduringness of it, like today in this talk, wow, yeah, like I said, tenure tomorrow, but I, I, here's what I can say now. Here's what I will try to do now. Um, and, and that is to say, I mean, it endures for a lot of reasons. I, I don't think I can narrow it down to just one, but here's what I shall say. Because race, the idea of race is something that I think we see it as it's legible. Like people think, okay, I can tell the race of a person, right? I can see it with my own eyes. I don't have to be trained, I can just tell. This is what people like to tell themselves. I would argue that you may not always know that, but there is a general sense that someone will say, oh, that person on the street, I know they're this, they're that, and that's all I need to know. So one, this, the, the kind of, um, the imprecision of race is hampering us, but it's something that I think we cling to, that people use it rightly or wrongly 
And because we can see it and perceive it and say, well, that person is, they look different. They obviously must have different features. It seems to me that there are ways in which this can continue to be manifest, even when people will say, oh, you know, of course I treat people the same, or I, no, I would never, you know, treat somebody differently because of their race, but then we'll still kind of assume, you know, that they're assume difference rather than sameness. And I think that I'm not really sure why it continues to endure in the way that it does. I mean, especially now when people say, oh, well, we know so much more. We know how yellow fever works. We know that it's not racial immunity. Yet at the same time, I should say, in the very early stages of this COVID-19 epidemic, I was interviewed by the BBC like, news and there was a claim that, oh, well, black people don't seem to be making up the first cases. Like when this just started, they're not, they're probably not gonna have a problem. And I was thinking to myself, we're already making that leap. And now here we are saying, no, 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 it's completely the opposite. So I think that there's this kind of impulse that we still use that's easy for anybody to kind of rely on. And I have to just say that I think the concept of race I think people think it's doing this kind of intellectual work and it's really not. And it still somehow sneaks its way into, um, you know, our, our so-called, you know, moving forward and learning more about things like human genome project. People are like, oh, okay, great. We're all the same. This is, we've got it all down to, to sort of genetic science. And yet still people, you know, still say, okay, well, we're, we're going to use race correction. It, it kind of seems contradictory a little well, let's, bit. Let's, let's explore that a little bit as well, because I think it is important. I mean, you know, part of the distinction is whether what we're seeing, for example, with respect to um, algorithms that um, adjust uh, GFR or algorithms that adjust lung function, whether that actually is the same thing that what we were seeing in the 1780s with regard to what Benjamin Rush was doing. I mean, certainly on the surface of it looks very similar, but the question really is what's going on there. So for example, there is, there's clearly distinctions with regard to susceptibility of certain diseases with respect to genetic ancestry. That is, genes segregate in certain ways and there are certain genetic predispositions to breast cancer, to prostate cancer, to glomerular and sclerosis of various kinds that segregate on the basis of genetic ancestry. And there is some correlation, it's not a perfect correlation, but there is some correlation between that and what we perceive as you talk about phenotypically as race. Um, so the question then becomes, what's the obligation of medicine today to disentangle those things in such a way that we are treating people according to what their actual risk factors are not assuming on the basis of how they look what those things are, but at the same time, not dismissing them. And, you know, I'm going to give you sort of this example that, that uh, you're, I'm sure, familiar with, where um, the, the convention of how we uh, present cases in medicine uh, includes this thing called the chief complaint, which is supposed to summarize why the person is coming to medical attention. And it, in my field, in pediatrics, a typical chief complaint might be, this is the first presentation of an eight-year-old African-American girl who comes to the hospital with three days history of abdominal pain, right? And so what you're encapsulating there are certain demographic features, their age, their sex, and their race, and then what it is the symptom that they're presenting with. The question is whether or not that should include race or not. And if so, what, why are we doing that? Why should we do it or should we not do it? What does it mean? How do we how do we ascribe the utility of that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, so that is, I mean, again, I think you're hitting upon part of why we need to have, I think, more of this dialogue with, um, you know, with practitioners, with clinicians who can tell us about this is how we make decisions or this is how we present cases with, with folks who are doing sort of what I was in my end, trying to unpack this in like sort of the abstract. So what I would say, for example, is that absolutely, you know, when we walk into a doctor's office or when you, you know, present and you talk about, um, you know, who the patient is, you want to pay attention to demographics. But I think the concern has been um, for, some, um, for some communities, right, to say, is there already going to be a negative association about what an African-American African -American young woman might be in, in, in a young girl in New York City? What does that connote for the person hearing it? Will they start making assumptions or will they just say, okay, what does this tell us about the likelihood of X, Y, and Z possibilities, which is fine. And I like specifically that you said genetic ancestry. If more people said that, that would be great because you're kind of showing 
that it's not this one-to-one -one correlation of, okay, your skin color is this, and so therefore you have that. If people were using the concept of genetic ancestry and, and finding ways to elegantly include that in their decision-making so that we're not collapsing it down to just skin color, I think that's a good step, but we just have to make sure we tell people that, you know, that isn't, your genes aren't always like what, you're, what you look, look like, like physically, like your skin color. So we have to make sure we do that in terms of our communication. And then I guess to the point of demographic data, I mean, I, I think you have to know your, your population to other, understand the, the disparity, right? So I know that there are people who say, oh, why do we even bother with this? I'm like, well, we don't we wanna know which populations are maybe being more affected so that we can properly intervene. But then the question of course becomes, you know, in making these assessments, do we ask the question of, if we focus on the race of the patient and we go through all of the clinical and statistical rationales, do we also then have a little bit of space to say, should we also consider how that person's care may or may not have been great consistently over time because of their race? I.e. thinking about, could racism have something to do with this? Should we start to ask this question? So I am all for the idea of using this, um, this kind of clinical classical case study. I think it makes sense, but I do think we have to start thinking about ways that we can um, uh, add or adjust or use that kind of um, different language. So I do appreciate that you said genetic ancestry in that regard. Right, it gets to the, and we, um, we've talked about this a little bit, it gets to the issue of what we mean when we talk about the objectification of black bodies, right? And what I was um, wanted to query you about is whether or not um, we are guilty in medicine of too much objectification or not enough. And by that, I mean, ideally what you would want people to do in terms of confronting any patient is pay attention to the important things with regard to what might, as you point out, affect the probability of certain conditions in that person and abstract from those aspects of the individual that don't pertain to that, which is a form of objectifying somebody. And what you want to do, in fact, or it may, you could make an argument that if you don't do that, if you don't um, objectify, if you don't sort of separate out these non-important things, you're actually not doing your job as opposed to doing it too well. So I'm interested in your reflections about that. So again, another really great question, and this has a lot to do with um, sort of the use of a, the, the concept of objectification in sort of these very different contexts. Um, and so I would absolutely agree, um, you know, in thinking about um, what the human body is, right, when you're confronted with, you know, you have to treat someone, you must perform surgery, et cetera. You have to sort of understand the body, the parts, what, focus on what your task is. And, 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 and that makes sense in terms of the objectification process. I think when, at least for, for in my research, and looking specifically at African-American and African-descended people, their objectification kind of remained constant. So one sort of seen as property. And then when your property is not working to call in a physician to then say, okay, fix this property, get them back into working order, that happens. And I would actually argue probably physicians, you know, did their best job to, to do that. But then the sense of seeing them as human, the sort of returning them to subject doesn't happen. That it is just simply that, okay, this is a body and now it's working again. Or in the case of teaching, look, I have shown you and demonstrated this on this body, that's it. And I think because that has attended the experience of Africans and people of African descent, and African Americans, that that notion of objectification of just like, I am just parts, I'm just here to serve this end is something that has been pervasive um, in some of these sources. But I certainly take the point that yes, it's, it's about not being able to come back to subjecthood, the, having that connection again. Um, after, you know, whatever um, medical procedure has been um, done or whatever kind of teaching um, has, has taken place. So, yeah, it, it, it's quite tricky. And I will say that um, part of the reasons why I love being a historian of medicine is to sort of have one foot in attending to the ways in which medical knowledge is produced and training. I'm um, so specifically focusing on the 19th century and the Paris Clinic and knowing that information, but then also straddling the line of thinking about the history of slavery and race and saying, okay, how do those things interact with each other and sometimes cause this, these discordances? And sort of that's where I see myself emerging sort of that in terms of the scholarly work. Listen, Dr. Hogarth, I could spend the rest of today and tomorrow talking to you about this stuff. 
that's how stimulating it is to to hear your thoughts. But I am not allowed apparently to monopolize the whole conversation. So um, unfortunately, I am now required to uh, open this up to the kinds of questions that other people who've been listening to you for the past 40 minutes might want to ask you. So I, I don't know who's running this, but I would ask them to take us to those questions now. Thank you, Dr. Racine. Uh, so we have a few questions from, the, from our audience tonight. Uh, the first one wants to know, Dr. Hogarth, um, if you have ever encountered any papers or sources where physicians from the North and South interacted and what kind of medical science discussions or exchanges they may have had. Were there concerns from other physicians regarding racial science coming from the South or discussions on dispelling these dangerous claims? Okay, so to the first point, if I'm understanding correctly, um, most certainly um, Northern and, and Southern physicians did like sort of, they did speak to each other or they read each other's papers. Um, so I know um, a really fantastic colleague of mine, um, Christopher Willoughby is actually working on medical education. He looks at a lot of um, the Louis Agassiz papers at Harvard. He looks at the sort of um, other physicians in the Philadelphia area and sort of how their ideas translate in the South. So these are more um, pro-slavery. As, as it were. So there were certainly Northern physicians who were very much kind of saying, well, you're not wrong, people in the South, or we're sympathetic to you, people in the South. So there is that kind of um, back and forth in terms of disagreement with some of these racial ideas. Um, really, I'm only seeing, um, you know, not in terms of North and South, but for example, James McCune Smith, an African American physician who trains at University of um, Glasgow, um, Scotland. He certainly is pushing back on, on certain claims about you know, inherent inferiority of black people. And he tries to marshal himself as a physician who does, he stays in the North, um, kind of saying like, you know, this is not right. And it's certainly, I would say, if you trace the medical um, treatises and texts, you're gonna see references, right, to such and such publication or such and such book or article by such and such physician. So I think physicians, region, regardless of region, are talking to each other. It's not like the North and South are cut off from each other. There is indeed a, a discourse going on about race. Um, the, the, the nuts and bolts of it, however, um, it would be something more along the lines of my colleague, Christopher Willis, that he work, really work, focuses on that. Great, thank you. Uh, another uh, participant would like to know, uh, why do these behaviors in, medical, in medicine perpetuate themselves um, in medical training in schools of medicine and public health? there is a need to reform medical education that might include the history of medicine in addition to the social determinants of health and other systems affecting health and health outcomes. Yeah, so why does it perpetuate itself? I mean, I, I, I must say, I, again, if I honestly, like, you know, I'll, if I figure this out, I will tell like, you know, the head of the university so I can be full professor. Like really, I would be like, all right, I got it. Here's what I'll say in terms of why it gets perpetuated. I think there's a couple of things going on. One, at least from my understanding, a lot of these ideas, there's not like one source, right? It's not like there's one book that has all of the terrible things. They're kind of these diffuse ideas that I think people hear in passing, but maybe don't really do much about it and it kind of continues to linger. So I have certainly had students tell me that sickle cell anemia is like a black person disease. And I'm like, no, but sometimes that word that, that gets said and nobody corrects them or they say, oh yeah, probably. Or you might have somebody make a reference about like a innate racial trait and nobody stops and says, wait, stop, where are you getting that from? So I think that in terms of some of these little statements like that, that Hoffman study showed us is that people may be harboring some of these ideas and they're just kind of hard, it's hard to get at. And it's just a matter of how we can measure and trace them, right? When she's saying it's implicit, I really don't think that there are, you know, people training physicians that are, you know, saying this group is different from this group because of their race. I think it's something that's more, so I, I hope it's something that's just more subtle that hasn't been challenged and questioned more openly um, in these kinds of um, educational settings. Thank you. Uh, do you think that the distinction between medical racism and racist medicine is useful for interrogating the past or present or is such a, dis or is such a distangling problematic? Can you repeat that? Because I'm, this, is, this is one of those questions that seems simple, but is actually quite, quite complicated, which I like. <laughs> can true. you say that again? Do you think that the distinction between medical racism and racist medicine is useful for interrogating the past or present, or is such a disentangling problematic? So here's what I want to say, and I don't know if I'm going to answer this person's question, but I really like how they phrase this question. So I think that there is actually a difference 
little bit of a subtle difference between medical racism and racist medicine. So I'm gonna start with racist medicine. I kind of see that with the emergence of um, sort of race science as well, which is, um, I would argue, the creation and production and circulation of ideas that are like sort of a priori, like our goal is to prove what we already think about this group of people. That it's not even about, um, it, it's not even about trying to dress it up as anything else. It's overt, it's bald, it's explicit. So I think specifically, um, gosh, you know, Josiah Knott was a very well-known uh, physician in, in the South. Um, he made no secret, published very widely on his views about black people and actually other um, non-white groups. And everything was just circular. <laughs> it was just like, you didn't even have to read the 600 page book to know what he was going to tell you. It was already there. Things could be manipulated, et cetera. For medical racism, I kind of tend to see that more of a case of um, something that's more, again, abstract, that it sort of emerges either through issues of exclusion, of assumptions, of a kind of um, undercurrent of what I might even say in, in my circumstances, like, like anti-Blackness, that people don't realize it, but it's there. So Benjamin Rush, for example, it's to me fits into this case of like medical racism and the fact that he is, he holds a kind of um, Eurocentric standard. He holds this standard and makes assumptions based on these Eurocentric standards that are necessarily um, harmful for African-Americans. So they, they don't feel pain, right? Now, is he setting up to do this because he wants to say that black people are these subhuman people and they must be, in fact, he came up with that. I should have say that excerpt was actually from um, a later publication in which he was advocating for the end of slavery by suggesting that black people actually suffered from a kind of leprosy. And that's why their skin was insensible. And if we could only just cure them of this problem, then we wouldn't have the problem, like black people wouldn't have these problems anymore. Like that was the purpose of it. Again, it's negative, it's racist, it's not great. But I think it's a very different animal than Josiah Knott, who his whole purpose in life was to denigrate um, people of color, like at all costs. And in your research, have you explored the role of psychiatry in perpetuation of racialized medicine? So I have, I have not. I, I confess, um, psychiatry. So I know the good, good work is out there. Um, Martin Summers has done work on this, um, and I'm blanking on his name. Nathan Metzl's work is, uh, has talks about like schizophrenia, I believe. Here's what I will say that I have encountered. Mostly thinking about the um, emancipation and the end the end of slavery. Suddenly, there were reports of um, African-Americans losing their minds and being unable to function due to being free. Prior to that, the claim was that, oh, these people don't get mental, they, they don't get those kinds of diseases. No, 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 it's, they're just a group of people that don't have to worry about this. So I have seen sort of the way in which context can shape the perception of susceptibility to certain kinds of what people would call mental disorders and so maybe falling into psychiatry. But in terms of my own research, like what I focus on, I, I have not really um, dipped my toe into psychiatry or the history of psychiatry and race, um, you know, that deeply. Um, you know, I, I, I can think other than, you know, the few um, scholars that I mentioned and like sort of rethinking Franz Fanon, but that's about as far as I have kind of gone in my own work. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one last question, um, and that is, Dr. Hogarth, where can we find your research? <laughs> oh, wh where can you find it? <laughs> All right. Um, so, okay, I, I did write. So I wrote. I wrote a book. Um, if if you would like to buy it, that's great. But I so I published um, one book, uh, Medicalizing Blackness: Making Racial Difference in the Atlantic World, um, the University of North Carolina Press in 2017. Um, I have been very um, lucky. Um, in the sense that I was able to participate um, in an invited special issue for the American Journal of Public Health, um, in which um, I offered some commentary about the myth of um, innate black immunity to yellow fever. Um, I was joined with a bunch of other fantastic scholars in this special issue. That was um, October, 2019. You might find my work there. Um, I have also um, published a little side thing in the, a little side thing as I like to call it, um, in the American uh, Quarterly, scholarly journal about um, experimentations with trying to remove black pigment um, by a Dr. John Beddoes. And so it's kind of a discussion of um, attempts that physicians made to get rid of blackness. Um, so yeah, I publish in you know, mostly scholarly 
kind of journals. I think most of them probably have paywalls, unfortunately, but really the meat of my work and research can be found um, in my book, Butterflies and Bugs. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate it. We learned a lot tonight. Um, and as we close, I just would like to turn it over to Dr. Robert Rubin, who is the chair of NIAM's section on history of medicine and public health. Well, thank you all very much for attending tonight's lecture. And a special thanks to Dr. Hogarth and, uh, for her remarks and Dr. Rasim for leading the discussion really very, very additive. And I cannot thank the two of you enough for what you've added to our understanding and intellectual life. On another note, on Wednesday, the 3rd of March, we will be hosting our 12th Annual History of Medicine Night. Those are contributed referee papers featuring short presentations on the topic of the history of pandemics and health disparities. Hope to see you on Wednesday, on Wednesday, the 3rd of March, Thank you again. Good night. Be safe and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's it. <laughs> well done. Thank you so much, everybody.